Thank you for joining us for today's webinar where we will be discussing credit reporting basics. This webinar is being recorded. All attendees will receive a follow-up email with today's recording and presentation deck within a week. All participants have been muted, so please use the Q&A box for any questions and we will answer them at the end. Your presenter today is Rod Griffin. He is the Senior Director of Consumer Education Advocacy at Experian. And with that, I'd like to now hand it off to Rod. Welcome, Rod. Great, Lena, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. Looking forward to sharing information with you and, and we'll do my best to answer any questions you have. There is a lot of ground to cover, so I'll go pretty quickly. Uh, as Lena said, please put any questions you have in the Q&A box uh, or in the chat box. And along the way, I have some questions for all of you too. So if you will put your answers there in, in the chat box when we get to them, you'll see what they are in a bit just to, to make sure we have some audience participation. But want to share today a lot of information about credit reporting and credit scoring, things that touch all of our lives, uh, mine included, even though I work with Experian, uh, just by way of background, uh, as Lena said, my name is Rod Griffin. I'm Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. Uh, I lead our national consumer education programs and work with our clients like Provident Credit Union, with individuals, with our own employees, with advocacy organizations to help share information that you need to be more financially successful and to understand what we do as a company at Experian and how you can be part of it and how you can take control of that information to work to your advantage. Uh, and I've been with Experian 26 years and I've picked up a few things along the way. So I hope to share some information that's helpful for you. There is a lot of, of myth and a lot of misinformation about credit reporting uh, and a lot of misunderstanding. So I want to make sure we have the right information for you and accurate information so that when you walk into a lender, you can walk in and, and you can tell them you're going to approve my loan because Provident, I know exactly what's in my credit report, what my credit scores are, and you're going to, you're going to want me uh, as your customer. So just to begin, I want to talk about what credit reports are, what credit scores are, and why they matter. Um, and clearly they matter for a number of reasons. I like to begin with this point, though, that credit is a privilege you earn. It's not a right that you have. It's built on the way you make financial decisions and the way you manage relationships with your lenders. You make those choices over time. Sometimes, granted, choices aren't under your complete control, uh, but you can recover if you have some difficulties. That's what I want to help you understand is how do you make the right choices from a creditor's perspective uh, and from the credit reporting and scoring perspective so that you have good credit scores, good credit reports, and that they will be there to work for you. So then that begs the question, what is credit in the first place? And it's simply obtaining goods or services and paying for them at a later date under agreed upon terms that are specified in a contract. So you have a lender loan you money. There's a contract that says, I'll repay all of that plus interest and other fees and charges associated with it on a certain date at a certain time um, by a certain date. So you have an obligation to complete those terms. When it comes to credit, we know the common things, things like credit cards, mortgages, car loans. We're all familiar with those. We don't often think about today things like cable television bills or streaming service bills like Netflix or Hulu or HBO Plus, cell phone bills, utility service for things like natural gas, water, or electricity. All of those things today can be a part of your credit history, a part of your credit report, and can affect credit scores. So it's not just about getting a credit card or a, or a car loan or getting a loan for some furniture today. It's about how you manage all of your financial relationships and how you can use them to your advantage. When you use those kinds of financial resources, they appear in a credit report and they become your financial references, kind of like references in a resume, for example. And you want them to be good, obviously. You want, if you're applying for a job, your references to say good things about you. If you're applying for a loan or a financial service of some other kind, you want your credit report, your financial references to say good things about you and want to help you be able to do that today. It's also important to understand that credit is not the same as debt. They are very closely related, obviously. If you have a credit account, you may have debt, but you don't have to. If you build a positive credit history, 
you'll be able to get the best terms and best rates, best financial opportunities. You invest in credit. Debt is the result of credit when you use it poorly. And by way of example, if you have a credit card and you get cash back for that credit card and you use that credit card for all of your purchases during the month and then you pay that balance in full, you're using credit to get cash back or discounts on purchases. That gives you a financial advantage. By paying the balance in full, you're not carrying any debt. So they're not the same thing, but they're closely related. Credit's a financial tool. Debt is the financial problem. Debt can be useful if you use it well. I encourage people to think about credit like businesses do. Uh, for example, my wife worked for a trucking company in their accounting department. The trucking company would borrow money to buy the trailers, for example, that went on their trucks because they could borrow the money at three or 4% interest rate. They would invest their cash and get a return of six or 8%, sometimes more. So they use their money to make money. They use the bank's money to help support their business. So they use their credit to their advantage. We should do that as individuals as well. Use credit as a financial tool. It can help you achieve your goals uh, and objectives in life and potentially acquire things that you otherwise couldn't if you manage well. Things like a house, most of us can't buy a house using cash we've saved. But if you use credit well, you can buy a house at very reasonable terms and, and be able to achieve that financial goal if, if that's your financial goal uh, and otherwise wouldn't be possible. Most of us can't pay cash for a new car in most cases today. But if you have good credit, you can get a, a, a new car at really good terms and good rates and, and use that to your advantage. So think about credit as a financial tool. Debt is the financial uh, difficulty, the financial problem. So we talked about your your financial references, your financial resume for what it, for for lack of a better term. Where does that happen? Who keeps that information? Well, most of us know today or have heard of Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. We are the the three. They call us the big three, the three national credit reporting companies. Sadly, people often don't come in contact with Experian until they've had a problem. And so they call our uh, Consumer Assistance Center, which uh, actually are, uh, was based or is based in Allen, Texas. Uh, so it's in the U.S. Uh, and talk to us about disputing information or because they've been a victim of identity theft or have had some other issue with their credit history. And we want to make sure we help them resolve those issues. But the reality is that in most cases, the credit report is used in the background of a financial decision and the applications approved, the financial uh, services provided without ever having to interact with the credit reporting companies. And that's the way we want it to be. We want it to be there to facilitate that transaction, to help support that relationship between you and Provident, for example, or you and other creditors, and not have to, to really engage with us in, unless you have a, a positive reason. What people don't realize is that because we have a national automated credit reporting system, we are able to obtain instant credit today. Uh, if you are shopping at the holidays at a brick and mortar store or you're online applying for credit to make a purchase, because we have an automated credit system, it allows lenders to approve your applications instantly. We make credit lower cost than anywhere else in the world. Uh, in the U.S., credit card rates today have an average, or an, on average, about 20 or 21 percent. That sounds really high. But in other parts of the world, it's more like 30% or, or more today because of inflation and all the things that have happened. So it's less expensive. There's no place in the world that you can buy a house at even 6% interest today, let alone two or three like it was a few years ago. Uh, and that's because the lenders are able to use credit history information to help manage risk, to make sure that you're qualified and that you'll be able to repay those debts and they reduce their losses which then are not passed on to everyone else. They can reduce the, the rates they charge. We make credit available nationwide. In the past, if you moved from New York to Los Angeles, you lost your credit, had to start all over again. Or if you moved even from one neighborhood to another, in many cases, or one town to another that were close by, you still started over because credit was based on a relationship you have with those merchants in that community. So if you 
work with a store, they get credit based on their personal relationship with you. And if you went somewhere else, you started all over again. Because you have nationwide credit available, your credit's there to go with you and work for you. If you move to, to Los Angeles from New York, you'll be able to rent an apartment or buy a house. You'll be able to potentially get a job. And I'll talk about credit reports versus scores. And just as tip one, scores are never used by employers, so they don't affect your ability to get, get a job, but your credit report might. And so you know, your credit report can help you get that job. It can help you get a place to live. It can help you get the car that you, you use to get to and from work. It can help you furnish that apartment or that home, all of those things that you need without having to start over again. Likewise, it makes credit widespread in terms of availability, meaning you can use credit for just about anything. You could, when you get that new apartment, buy green curtains and an orange couch and yellow carpet if you wanted to. Clearly, I'm not a, a, an interior decorator, but you could do that. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Credit is best used uh, carefully and wisely and not for everything, but you could. Um, and I'll talk about what a credit report looks like in just a little bit, uh, Tass. So thanks for the question. I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, but you can get use credit for just about anything. Most importantly, and one of the, the key things I, I hope you will take away today is that your credit report is a financial management tool. You should use it very much like you use a billing statement uh, or your bank statement each month to know what's in your bank account or what your bills are. You should know what's in your credit report. You should check it at least once a year, if not more often. They're free. Uh, in rarely is there a reason you should pay for a credit report today. You can get a free report from each of the credit bureaus once a week through annualcreditreport.com. Uh, right now, through the end of this year, and it may continue, I'm not sure. You can get free reports if you enroll in monitoring services that like experience it's free once a month along with a score. You can get a report if you're unemployed seeking employment, if you've been a victim of identity theft, if you've had adverse action taken. So check your credit report. Know what's in there because that gives you the power to act on it. Uh, so use that credit report to your advantage. Credit reports are important because they're a record of your financial accounts and the obligations and identification information goes with them. And I'll talk specifically about what's in a credit report in just a few minutes. We call it a credit file, a credit report, a credit history. They're all the same thing, really. And I use those terms interchangeably. Uh, so if you hear those terms are referring to the same thing, a record of your financial obligations and, and the identification that goes with them. Lenders obviously use those reports and scores to determine that you'll repay a debt as agreed. But they also can use a credit report for things like getting a cell phone account. Uh, they will affect how much you pay for that cell phone potentially or the plan that you're able to obtain. It can affect uh, you, the decision to lease an apartment because it's considered in those decisions. It can affect utility service uh, acquisition when you get uh, a new place to live and being able to qualify to get that utility service applied uh, and what the fees and rates might be. Uh, if you're like me, I happen to live in Texas and, and we have an open utility um, marketplace. And so when we check utility rates, our credit could be considered in that, uh, that uh, decision. And each year we look at that and we can actually get lower utility rates because we have good credit. Uh, and, and that becomes part of the consideration. Good credit can play a part in the insurance rates you pay for your car insurance, your homeowner's insurance, and those sorts of things. So Credit reports are really important beyond just getting a loan or a credit card. They serve as your references, again, to any business relationship you have and any financial relationship that you might have. So it's really important to understand what a credit report it is, is where it comes from, and when, and, and what your role in that process is. So where exactly does a credit report come from? Well, I often talk to people who have had a new baby and they say, I just got my new child's social security number. I'd like to get a copy of their credit report too. And I tell them, I hope not because we shouldn't have one. If your new baby has a credit report, it's because they're already an identity theft victim. So we don't want that to happen. Traditionally and historically, a credit report only comes into existence for you when you open your first credit account. So when you apply for credit with the lender, at the end of that first billing cycle, you're going to pay the lender, we hope, at least the minimum due. They'll update their records. And at that point, they will report that account to Experian and we create a credit report for you. So you wouldn't have a credit report 
necessarily until 30 to 45 days after you've opened your first account, uh, because that's when there's something to report to the credit bureaus. You'll continue to make those payments on time each month. And at some point you'll apply for new credit with someone else. That lender will look at that payment history for your first account and say, yes, you're a good risk. We'll open an account for you too. And that cycle starts over and that new account gets added. And over time you build that credit history with different kinds of uh, credit relationships you might have, different financial relationships you have over time, and that grows. So really straightforward, really simple, but you really typically don't see a, a credit report for a person in most cases until they're in their late teens. If you're uh, like me, I got my first car when I was 16, and I and actually my, my grandparents helped, but you may get a small, small car loan, uh, those sorts of things, your first credit card when you're 21, 22, you may see then that's when we see credit established typically for the first time. Uh, but you might be an authorized user on a parent's credit card account. There are other ways you may have a credit history established for you. There's a lot of confusion about Experian's role and the credit reporting company's role in the, the credit process and the credit universe. People tell me, well, the credit reporting company, Experian denied my, my application. Uh, Experian decides whether or not I have good credit scores. Experian decides whether or not my credit's good uh, or bad. The reality is we don't make any of those decisions. Our role as a credit reporting company is to collect and store information in a way that lenders can then check it out, kind of like a library stores books on shelves and uses the, when I was young, it was a Dewey Decimal System. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but we store credit reports in, in a way that is formatted and accessible by a lender, kind of like you would go to a library, get the book you need to read and check it out to them. The lender then uses that information to help them decide whether or not you qualify for their particular loan or credit card or other service that you're applying for. We don't make those decisions. We don't decide if a person has good or bad credit. We don't edit the information in a credit report. Our any more than a library would edit Shakespeare. We, as a credit reporting company, collect and store information to accurately represent what lenders tell us is in their records so that they and you can see what's there and can address it and make sure that it's correct. Credit reports are highly accurate. Uh, so uh, we, we do a very good job. We're not perfect but do a very, very, very good job. If a lender wants a credit report, they have to have what's called a permissible purpose under federal law. Kind of like if you go into a library, you have to have a library card to check out the book. So a permissible purpose is required for that lender to check out your credit report and to access it. So that permissible purpose says, here's why and they can get a report and gives them permission to. Here's a question for all of you. Which of these do you think is not a permissible purpose for accessing a person's credit report? A, offers of credit, B, underwriting insurance, C, test driving a new car, or D, eligibility for a government license. If you put, put your answer in the chat box. We'll see what everybody thinks. Can a lender get a credit report to make offers of credit? Can they get one to underwrite insurance? Can they get one when you test drive a new car? Can they get one to determine if you qualify for a government license? What do you think? We'll give just a few seconds. Oh, chat's disabled. Well, that's a bummer. What about Q&A? Can you go into the Q&A box? We have... Okay, so we have D, we have a C in the Q&A. Scroll down, C. All right, some of you, pretty sharp. Most people get this wrong. It's C, to test drive a new car. So if you go to the Ferrari dealership and say, I wanna take that Ferrari for a drive and the Ferrari dealership says, sure, let's go drive around town and you, Get in, you drive around town, you pull back up into the lot, say thank you very much and walk away. They do not have a permissible purpose to access your credit report. If, however, during that drive, you say, how much does this cost 
you've now initiated a financial discussion and they have a permissible purpose to check your credit report. So it's at the point where you start to discuss purchasing the car or the value of the car, the cost of the car that you trigger that permissible purpose. So these are the permissible purposes under the law and they're pretty limited to open or manage credit accounts. That would seem pretty obvious to, to make pre-approved or pre-screened offers of credit. So if you get a pre-approved offer in the mail for a credit card, what happens in those instances is the lender sends a list of criteria that they want to match to, to the credit reporting companies and say, can you output a, a mailing list of the people with credit reports that meet these criteria? And we then, through an automated process, enter the content, the, the criteria, compare it to the 220 million credit reports in our system and output a mailing list for that lender of the people who meet the criteria they specify. And it could be anything from they have you know credit card accounts that are all paid on time to the zip code they live in so that they're sending to their particular customers. And that information then goes to a mailing house. It's usually printed on a, uh, a card or a letter and, and then it's sent to the consumer. People really don't actually look at the credit report. Uh, so in an automated process like that, if you get a pre-approved offer, I always tell people be proud because that means they want you to be their customer. That empowers you as a consumer because it opens up the credit marketplace to the nation. So instead of just working with local creditors, if you're getting offers from around the country, it causes businesses to compete for your, your um uh, for you to be a customer, which means they'll offer better terms, better rates, better prices, lower costs. So that can work to your advantage. So if you get pre-approved offers and you can say no, that can be a fantastic tool. No is the most powerful word in credit. It's also the little short word, but it's hard to say sometimes. But pre-approved offers of credit can be a financial tool. If you don't want to get pre-approved offers, you can opt out of that system. All you have to do is call one 5 opt out one 8 8 one 567 8688 and you can opt out of getting pre-approved offers that are generated through the national credit reporting companies. Uh, pretty simple to do. Credit reports may be used for employment purposes, but not credit scores. We do not at Experian provide credit scores for employment purposes. And the report an employer receives is quite different than a lender would receive. We remove any information that would violate Equal Employment Opportunity Act regulations. So there's nothing, for example, about age, marital status, those sorts of things. Uh, we also eliminate account numbers because an employer doesn't need it. And employers must get written permission before they request your credit report. So it's a, a truncated, shortened version of a credit report with limited information that requires written permission first. Employers typically use credit reports for one of two reasons for when you're applying for a job or a promotion, it's either you're applying for a job that involves managing the company and the company's money in some way, or they're doing it to, to verify your identity. So if you provide a resume uh, or an application, they'll get the credit report and match your name, your address, your social security number, your list of previous employers to your credit report to verify you are who you say you are. The reason is one, uh, employment fraud, but also security and safety. In, in Texas, in Houston, for example, in Houston, Texas, there are chemical plants. They will get a credit report and match it to an application to make sure that that person isn't someone they don't claim, they don't say they are, if they're, they're fraud, defrauding them in the, in the employment process because they don't want someone to access dangerous chemicals that could harm the public. So, those are the two most common reasons we see credit reports used for employment purposes. To underwrite insurance, that's been part of the law since 1972 or so, uh, when it was first enacted, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Insurance companies are looking at reports for two reasons. One, they want to be sure that you can pay your insurance premium on time, which is a lot like a loan. It's a, it's a financial uh, consideration. The other reason is they're determining the likelihood that you will make a financial claim. They're not predicting you'll have a wreck. Uh, people 
people tell me that all the time. I said, no, they're not predicting a wrecked car. They're predicting you'll make a financial claim. So it's a financial decision. And they've done lots of research that shows that there's a correlation uh, to insurance claims related to credit histories. Um, so uh, in some states, they're they're prohibiting that, that practice and, and removing it at a state level. A business transaction initiated by the consumer means you applied for credit. Pretty straightforward. A court order or federal grand jury subpoena, of course, we're going to honor valuation of risk of an investor. So if you go to a startup and say, I want to invest a million dollars in your startup company, they could get your credit report and say, but you have $3 million in debt you need to pay first. Eligibility for certain government licenses and things like security clearances. So if you serve in the armed forces uh, or have family members or friends who do, first, let me thank you for your service. And second, they will use credit reports to uh, re help you qualify or qualify you for security clearances. If you have issues with your credit report, you may not. So it becomes a really important piece of, of that job. Uh, and disclosure to you as a consumer. You can get your credit report as often as you like. Doesn't affect lending decisions, doesn't affect credit scores in any way. So I strongly encourage you to get your credit reports so that you can see what's in them and act on them. Checking the questions really quickly, and we're about to get to what credit reports look like in a couple of slides. Um, so who are the players in that process? So we've talked about what credit reports are, how they come into being. So who touches them? Who Who is part of that process? Well, pretty straightforward. Credit reporting companies like Experian collect and store that information that becomes a credit report. Lenders use that information in the credit report to help them determine whether or not they want to uh, have you as a customer to determine whether you will repay a debt as agreed, for example. Risk score modelers, most people know about, but don't realize it. Risk score modelers are those companies that actually create the algorithms. Credit reporting companies don't do that. They, the credit scores belong to the credit score developers. You probably know the, the name FICO. So it used to be Fair Isaac Corporation. They, they've now shortened that to officially FICO. Uh, Vantage Score is another. They are the ones who create the algorithms that pull credit report information into them to do the calculation. Those algorithms are proprietary to them. They own those formulas. The credit reporting company doesn't have access to them directly. We know a lot, a lot about them, of course, but we don't have the formulas themselves are proprietary to the risk score modeler. So they're called FICO scores because they are FICOs with an apostrophe S, FICO scores. Uh, and that's an important to understand because they're a whole separate process from the credit reporting system. Um, and, I'll, uh, and I'll talk about that as well. The government, of course, we are very heavily regulated in our industry at the federal level as well as at the state level. Uh, and there actually was a county in California that had a county ordinance that regulated credit reporting. Uh, and everything from what can be in a credit report and how you access it to if we print a credit report, what typeface font we have to use and what size it needs to be. So very heavily regulated. Uh, but you, of course, are at the center of that cycle. You determine how you're going to use credit. You determine how much credit you're going to apply for, whether you're going to re repay the debt in full uh, as agreed, if you're going to use a credit card, whether you're going to pay the minimum minimum due each month or the balance in full or something in between. And if you're going to max out the card or just make a minimum number of purchases, that, that's up to you. And so you have control over the information that actually goes into that credit report. And things have changed so that you have even more control today because you can have positive information reported that couldn't in the past and that, that businesses typically don't report to us. It's important to stress that information comes from you. When you apply for credit, it's important to be consistent in the way Way that you do that. The information that you provide in your application is the first information that goes into a credit report. So I encourage people to be very consistent and be very thorough in the way you apply. For example, if you use your full given name from your birth certificate, that's a good way to apply for credit. If you use a nickname, for example, if your name's Robert and you apply as Bob, consistently apply as Bob because that's going to help match. The reason is that when you apply for credit, each lender will report the information you use in that application. So it will create different variations in name spelling and address and so on. So if you're consistent, it helps us ensure that we're matching the correct information to your credit report. Uh, I always use my dad as an example. He could never decide what his name was. His name was Adrian Dale Griffin. And every year he'd get his report and he'd look at it and say, son, you should only have the right name on my report. And I'd say, well, dad, what do you mean? He said, well, it's there. Adrian Dale Griffin was there, but 
Adrian Griffin and Dale Griffin and Adrian D. Griffin and A. Dale Griffin and A. D. Griffin were all also part of the report. And I every year told them, well, that if you just pick one, because he used all of those to apply for credit. So each account with that reported it, that if you just pick a name, that's what would be on the report. So be consistent. It helps uh, in, in making sure we have accurate information. Uh, and a couple more good questions. I'll get to those too. What does it mean to apply for credit? So that means if you go to a lender and you want a, a loan, you complete an application form. You'll provide information about your identity. You'll provide information about uh, your employers. You'll provide information about other kinds of assets you have and accounts you have. And they will requ request a credit report from Experian to look at your financial references. So that's what applying means. So you complete an application. You, you ask a lender for a loan. And that's that's the application. At that point, they can then request your credit report and review it. Um, so that's that's what applying is. And I'll get to credit scores in just a minute. So let's talk about we've talked about credit reports, where they come from, what's in them is the next question. So we talked about you know who the players are, what's in a credit report. Well, fundamentally, anything that's debt related is part of a credit report. So it's your identifying information. We need to know who you are. So that will include your name, your address, your social security number, your date of birth, any previous addresses, any variations in your name spelling, any variations in your social security number. We include those variations because you need to see what's being reported to us. When you read about errors in credit reports in those surveys and so-called studies, if you read the fine print and the two most cited ones that I've seen in the 26 years I've done this, both instances say that 85% of the errors they they are counting are variations in name, address, social security number, date of birth, uh, or, or name, address, social security number, previous address. Those are not errors. We list those on purpose because you need to see them. It's possible that you're, you're like my dad was and use different names to apply and they're all accurate. But it's also possible that someone's stolen your identity and if they use a different name or a different social security number, or a different address, it could tip you off that you're a victim of fraud. We wouldn't know that that's the incorrect social security number because we don't have access to the social security administration records. We probably could determine that it, it was incorrect if there's one and you have 10 different accounts and nine of those social security numbers are the same and there's one different one, but it might not be. Most often when we see that, it's because there's a transposed digit when the lender was putting the account information into their records. And instead of one, two, three, four, they type one, three, two, four. We can help you resolve that very easily, but we're not going to leave it out because it could be a sign of fraud. And then you wouldn't know to act on it and we couldn't help you identify it. So when you see those, those aren't errors, but they also do not affect credit scores in any way. They don't affect lending decisions. Uh, they're there so that you have a record of, of how information is being reported as belonging to you. Account information, of course, is the heart of the credit report. It's any type of account you have, whether it's a an installment loan for something like buying a car, where you pay a certain amount on a certain date each month for a certain number of months until it's paid off, or what we call a revolving account, which is just a fancy term for a credit card, where you can make a charge each month on the account up to a certain limit, and then you determine whether you're going to pay the minimum amount due or pay it off in full or something in between, and you can carry a balance from month to month. That's what they call it revolving. You can revolve it from month to month. We'll also show your association with that account, whether you're the primary account holder, whether you're an authorized user, whether you're a joint account holder, whether you're a co-signer and so on. We will show most importantly, the payment history for that account. Is the account being paid on time or is it late? If it's on time, was it late? That is by far the most important piece of information in the credit report. If your payments are late, it's going to make it much more difficult to get the credit you want in the future. So your payment history is very important. If you have an account uh, that's in the report, we'll also show the status that it's being paid current or that it's delinquent or late. If it's late, we'll show how late it is, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, because credit reports look at payments on a billing cycle um, calendar. So every 30 days. Uh, yeah, payments typically do. So you would say 30 days, uh, 60 days, 90 days late. If you have a payment that's due today and you you don't get it there on time, but tomorrow you make that payment, it probably will never show up on your credit report because you're not a full 30 days late. 
your late payments only show when they are a full 30 days late on your credit report. So important to understand. Account bankruptcy public records are the only public record today that's part of your credit report. Uh, we used to have things like library fines, parking tickets, civil judgments. So if you were sued and you lost, it uh, could be in a credit report. Paid tax liens, unpaid tax liens were part of a credit report. That's no longer the case. The only public record that's part of a report are bankruptcy public records. So if you declare bankruptcy in a legal process, that could be part of your credit report. Inquiries are simply a record that someone's looked at your credit report. There are two kinds. It's important to understand. The first is what we call hard inquiries. Those are the result of you applying for credit. And so there's potentially a new debt that doesn't show as an account yet in your credit report. An inquiry is simply a record that someone's looked at that report. So that hard inquiry says there's potentially a new account. They've applied for a new debt. That represents a little bit of risk. So it's shared with lenders and it can affect credit scores, although it's the least important factor in credit scores by far. Uh, and if an inquiry has any real effect on a lending decision, it's because there are other more serious issues already at play. So things like late payments or charge-offs as a loss, um, bankruptcy, collection accounts, all of those sorts of things. The other kind of inquiry are what we call soft inquiries. Those are everything else. So getting your own credit report, insurance, employment, pre-approved credit offers, reviews by existing lenders, all of those things where you're not really initiating a credit transaction or applying for a new debt, those are shown only to you on your personal credit report. They're not shown to anyone else. It's so that you'll have a complete record of who's looked at your report, but they don't affect lending decisions or credit scores in any way. So you may see lots of soft inquiries. I've seen 30 on an account. None of them affect credit scores. Hard inquiries are usually far fewer, typically, you know, two or three in a, a you know, like a three to six month period is fairly normal. People don't apply for a lot of credit all the time. And so you typically don't see a lot of, of applications in a short period, but you'll see both on your credit report and dispute instructions are part of your credit report. If you find something you believe is incorrect, dispute instructions tell you exactly what you need to do to have that addressed and to say, hey, this is wrong. I, I believe it's wrong and need you to go back to the source of the information and dispute that for us. Before we get to disputes, what's not in a credit report? Anything that's not debt related. So credit reporting companies do not have things about criminal background or arrest records. We don't have medical information. Everybody stops me at that point and says, what about medical collections? And that's true. Medical collections may be part of a credit report. The lender will only see medical collection. We remove anything that would conflict with the Health Insurance Privacy and Portability Act, HIPAA, HIPPA. And so there's nothing about the name of the lender there's, or the name of the healthcare provider, nothing about the doctor, nothing about the illness you might have had or the treatment you received in the lender's version. It just says medical collection. On your personal report, you would see the name of the medical collection company or the healthcare provider, whoever's trying to collect that amount, because you might need to know that you might need to contact them. So we will share that with you. There's been a, a lot of change related to medical collections in credit reports. For the most part, they're gone uh, from credit reports. So uh, beginning several years ago, the way medical collections were treated began to shift. Uh, medical collections had less of an impact on credit scores. We then, and then once paid, medical scores began to ignore those accounts. In the last year, we've removed any medical collections that are paid from credit reports. And now it's just in the last few months, We've removed any medical collections that are for less than $500. So there are about 70% of the medical collections that were part of credit reports are now removed from, from them. So they're not part of our history anymore. It would have to be a medical collection that was fairly substantial and that was uh, delinquent. We also hold medical collections for six months before we include them in a credit report. Actually, to take that back, we now hold them a year before we include them in a credit report to make sure that it's not the result of a billing error or an insurance dispute, things like that, that it's a, a legitimate collection account from that medical provider. Uh, so it's, it's relatively rare for medical collections to appear in credit reports today, but not unheard of. We don't have information about your buying habits or transaction data, meaning we don't know what you buy. Uh, if you use your credit card, we just see the balance go up 
I wouldn't know if you bought a brand new Candy Apple Red Corvette Z06 convertible with a black leather interior. Um, I don't have one either. My wife won't let me get one. She's the sensible one. Uh, <laughs> and my credit report, would I don't want that on my credit report. So that that debt on my credit report would be a big purchase. But it would just show auto loan. And so we know you probably bought a car. That's all we would know. There's nothing about assets on a credit report. There's nothing about your income, nothing about your checking accounts, CDs, IRAs, 401k. So nothing about investments or uh, or bank relationships because lenders are looking at credit reports to, to determine what we call your propensity to repay, the likelihood you'll repay a debt as agreed. They look at other documents to determine your ability to repay. So they're going to look at check stubs and your, your checking account and, and savings account balances and your other assets to, to determine your ability to repay. The reality is that just because a person has the ability to repay a debt doesn't mean they have the propensity to. They may not use their assets to pay that debt as agreed. So there's two sides to that coin. And credit scores are not part of a credit report. They're a separate process. Uh, that is used by lenders to evaluate the information in the credit report to determine whether you are likely to repay a debt as agreed. Uh, so they're a separate process. Before I get to that, I mentioned some things that are now in credit reports that weren't before. <coughs> Excuse me. Experian Boost was launched in 2019, uh, now four years ago. It enables you to add your positive, and that's a key where your positive utility payments, things like natural gas, water, electricity, your streaming services for things like Netflix or Hulu uh, or HBO Plus, your cell phone payments and rent payments to your credit history. It's a free permission-based service. We see that about two out of three people see improvement in their credit scores right away. The way the service works is you enroll in our free monitoring service. Actually, let me back up. That's the next slide. If you, you go to experian.com slash boost and follow the instructions, we will help you connect your payments from a checking account, savings account, a credit card account to the uh, account you want to pay. And you tell us which ones you want. And we will then add them as accounts to your credit report. So you can tell us, I want to add my natural gas bill, my Netflix bill, and my rent to my credit report will help you connect those payments from your monthly account that you pay them from. And every month we'll add that payment to your credit report as part of that account and show a positive history. We'll go back up to 24 months of payment history right away. We give you a free credit report and a free credit score, when FICO 8 score to be specific when you start the process. And we give you a new FICO 8 score or credit report at the end of that process. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes for most people. We're seeing scores improve on average about 13 points, 12 to 13 points. If you have a what we call a thin credit file, a credit history of less than five accounts or credit scores below 680, we're seeing average increases of closer to 19 points. So it's a great tool to help get credit for things that typically aren't reported to us because those organizations, streaming services, cell phone companies, um, rent uh, and apartment management complexes, utility services don't typically report information to Experian until you're late. And then the negative information gets there, but you don't get credit for the positive information. We want to empower you to do that. So Experian Boost is a great tool to help you get uh, started if you're beginning to build credit or if you had some issues to help you start to recover and move in the right direction. So really been powerful. The uh, second tool that we now have is called Experian Go. Uh, we know that there are 28 million credit invisible consumers. We also know that more than a quarter of Black and Hispanic consumers are unscorable or credit invisible, that there are young adults, about 4 million every year who turn 18, and about 20 million between 18 and 23 who are beginning to build credit for the first time. Experian Go is a tool that if you come to Experian, enroll in our credit monitoring service for free, and you do not have a credit report with Experian, we'll help you create one with the identifying information you provide to us. Once that credit report is created in our system, you'll be able to go through Experian Boost if you have a cell phone account or so on and add that information to your credit report. What we have seen is that people with absolutely no credit history today are able to participate in the Experian Go service that and then add Boost and, and move from no credit history at all to scores in the 630 range. So hugely powerful in helping gain access to a traditional credit reporting system. 
really powerful in breaking cycles of predatory lending and helping you become more financially healthy. And that's what that's really all about. And, and it's entirely free. If you find something you believe is inaccurate in your credit report, you can initiate a dispute. I'm going kind of the auctioneer mode at the moment, <laughs> trying to get, get all the information in. But we encourage you to dispute any information you believe is inaccurate. You can do it online at experian.com slash dispute. If you don't have a current credit report, we'll give you a free one right there. And you just follow the instructions, click on the buttons next to the things you need to dispute. Tell us what, you're, what you need to dispute. The account's not mine. The account was never late. This account is fraudulent. And we'll will submit those disputes to the lenders. Be specific in that dispute. If you call or write, you need to tell us, this is not my account, or this is never late, or this is fraudulent, and we need to be specific to help make sure that we're relaying the, the correct information and precise information to the lender. You need to allow 30 to 45 days for processing. Typically, disputes are completed in 10 to 14 business days, often today in two to three days simply because most of the transmission is, is automated. We don't have to mail things back and forth anymore. It makes it much more secure. We use encrypted systems and so on. If you disagree with the results of, dis of dispute, this last check mark is really the key one. We strongly encourage you to add what we call a statement of dispute to your credit report. It says, I believe I'm a victim. I'm, it says, I disagree and here's why. I'm skipping to the fraud presentation. Uh, it, it says, I disagree and here's why and let you tell your side of the story. Anytime a lender requests your credit report, they are notified that that statement is on your file and they should look at it and it should give you an opportunity to at least argue your case and tell your side of the story. So we strongly add, encourage you to add statements of dispute to your report if you disagree with the results. That brings us to how long information is kept on a report, which is one of the most popular questions I get. And it's really straightforward. Open accounts in good standing remain indefinitely. I've seen credit cards for 20 or 30 or 40 years that have been open, paid on time, still still used. Closed accounts in good standing, mean never late or no negative information, remain 10 years from the date they're closed. Late payments or missed payments remain for seven years from the date of the missed payment. So we keep good stuff longer than bad stuff. That helps you recover if you've had some issues and make sure the good information is there to work for you. Collection accounts remain seven years from the date of the or from what we call the original delinquency date of the original debt. That means it's seven years. If you have an account, it's hard to explain sometimes. If you have an account, you fall behind, you miss a payment today, you never catch up. That account is charged off as a loss and sold to collections. Seven years from today, the original date, because you were never current again, and the collection account will be deleted. So we treat a collection account as a continuation of the original debt. That can be a little bit confusing. Chapter seven bankruptcy remains for 10 years from the filing date. Chapter 13 bankruptcy remains seven years. The reason is that under chapter seven, you do not repay any of the debt. Under chapter 13, you do repay part of the debt so it doesn't stay quite as long. And inquiries remain on your report for two years from the date of the inquiry. FICO says they ignore them after one year. They really only affect scores for a couple of months because by that time, there's either a new account and that becomes the risk indicator or there isn't a new account, so it doesn't represent risk. So it requires short-term minimal impact on scores. So quick poll, when, which of the following is not a myth? And I'm going to hit some quick ones here. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to give the answer because I've talked too much. Uh, when paid, the bad debt will go away. B, a person can have a 900 credit score. C, consumers must give their permission for a report to be issued. Or D, the credit bureaus are responsible for choosing who gets credit. The answer is actually B, you can have a 900 credit score. Believe it or not, 850 is kind of the most recognized high score. Most scores go from 350 to 850. But scores from FICO for car lending, auto lending, their auto loan scores go to 900. So you could have a 900 score if you have a quote, perfect score on that scoring model. Uh, most people don't have perfect scores. I don't either. I don't worry about that too much. I'll explain why in just a second. I'll touch on a couple of these here, the corners. When paid, the bad debt goes away. It doesn't. Your credit reports are credit history. The status of the account will be updated to show paid, but it will still remain for those time frames I just discussed. The divorce decree separates joint accounts. It doesn't. And unfortunately, it's a very difficult time. The divorce decree is an agreement between the divorcing couple and the court. It does not break the contracts you have with lenders. You have to go back to the lender and they have to agree to change those contracts. They might not. It's up to them. 
things like a mortgage, for example, they have both parties as signers on that mortgage to protect them from loss. They may require that you refinance or sell the house in order to change that contract. You must give your permission for a report to be issued. You do not, except for employment purposes, which I, I talked about a little while ago. In most cases you do, when you sign the application, it says somewhere in, in the application that you're giving permission to access a report by signing the application, but you don't have to. Pre-approved offers are an example. You don't get permission, but you get an offer in the mail. When you complete that, that offer and say, I want to accept it, you're now applying for credit. They can then check your credit report again. So something important to know. And there's only one credit score. It's on every credit report. In fact, there are three credit reports but there are hundreds of credit scores and they are not part of the credit re report. They're a separate process from the credit report. So take a quick breath um, and we'll get to credit scores in just a second. What's the best way to clean up or challenge an item in your report? And that's the easiest way is to go to experian.com slash dispute and follow instructions. It's like a, a shopping cart. You click the, the button next to the item you need to dispute. We'll give you some choices and let you, you know, identify what you need to dispute and then hit submit when you're done. That goes into our system, goes directly to the source of that information. They are required by the Fair Credit Reporting Act to then review their records and determine whether that account or that information should remain as it's reported, whether it should be deleted or whether it should be updated in some way. And they will notify us. They have 30 days to do that. We will then send a notice to you uh, as to the results of that dispute. And then if you disagree, you can add a statement of dispute to the report. And we also, through that process, if you have documentation you want to send, you can upload that with it and send it. Anything you send us, we'll send to the lender. Uh, so as long as it's not defamatory or um, you know things like that, but if it's factually related to the dispute. So what is a credit score? A credit score is simply a tool that lenders use to help them evaluate the information in a credit report. As I mentioned, there are lots of different scores, what we call models with many different scales. I've actually seen a score with a scale of 75 to 108, still don't know why. I've seen scales for credit scores that go from 1,300 to zero, the lower the score, the better. Uh, and so the scales can be all over the place. That's why I tell people don't try to match the number to a number if you get two different scores, because they're probably from different scales. Uh, they may be um, you know, different types of scores, which I'm about to get to. And the question about why do scores vary so much from the three bureaus? They actually don't vary from the bureaus. They vary from the lender. Um, and it's for a simple reason. So our role as a credit reporting company is to apply what we call apply a model, meaning when someone asks for my credit report, a, a, a lender, so Provident Credit Union asks for my, Rod Griffin's credit report, we will compile that credit report. And Provident can tell us we want the FICO 8 score apply. We'll compile the report. FICO effectively rents space from us on our computer systems, and they pay us to house the, or what we call reside, have their scores reside in our system. We will route the report into that space. Think of an apartment through the keyhole into that apartment that they're renting from us. The scores are calculated, and the report and the score go out to the lender in parallel. When it gets to the lender, the lender can say, I want the identifying information from the report to show up on my screen first or to print out first. And then I want the credit scores and then I want the rest of the report. So it looks like this credit score is part of the report when in fact it's not. The credit score represents the information in that credit report at the moment it's requested. 10 minutes later, there could be a new inquiry. A payment might've been updated. Information could have changed. So when a lender asks for a score, they uh, would potentially get a different score. There are three credit reports. So you have three credit reports, one from Experian, one from TransUnion, one from Equifax. In our systems, we can apply something in excess of 200 credit scores. That's just in our systems. And Experian applying a model is one way that happens. In many cases, we will send a report to a lender. They have their own scoring systems. They get the report directly from us and then they apply the scores that they have that we call custom scores for their particular uh, use. So we wouldn't as a credit bureau see those scores at all. Uh, in mortgage lending, we'll send reports to a third party mortgage reporting company. That mortgage reporting company will combine reports from Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. It might, if it's a, a mortgage, they might get reports from 
a, you know, from two people, whether it's a, a married couple or, or partners who are uh, buying a house on their own, merge that information in mortgage lending. It's unique in, in the lending world. They can add other details from uh, asset information and application information, and then they apply scores and send that information to the lender. So the credit bureau wouldn't see those either. So we are not always involved in scores. The reason there are so many different scores is that there are different types of lenders and there are different types of lending and scores are developed for those particular types of lenders and those particular kinds of lending. So if you are working with Provident Credit Union, they may have their own score because they're a credit union and they're looking at their customers and they they have scores potentially that reflect their particular customer behaviors. If you're working with a national bank, their customers may behave differently. So they have scores that predict the, the, the payment behavior of their customers. If you're buying a car, there are cars specifically for auto lending, for car lending, because they want to determine whether you'll pay the car loan on time or not. They're not as concerned with your credit cards or your mortgage. If you have a credit card, there are bank card scores. They're trying to decide whether you'll pay your credit credit card on time. So those scores are different. They all weigh the information from your credit report, but they do so differently dependent on the type of lending and the type of lender. That's why there are so many different credit scores. They're designed to meet the needs of their particular customer. And so that's what that's a, that's all about. Kind of like if you walk onto a car, car lot uh, and you see the Ford F-150, most popular vehicle sold in the country. If you just saw one model with one set of options, you probably wouldn't buy that truck. But there are dozens of different versions of a Ford F-150. There's four-wheel drive and two-wheel drive. There's four-door and two-door. There's long bed and short bed. Because they're while they're basically the same truck, there are slight differences to meet the particular needs of that individual who needs that vehicle. Scores are kind of the same way. Uh, the scores are developed to need, meet the needs of a specific, specific lender, a specific type of lending. That said, because there are so many different numbers and so many different scores, how do you know if a score is good and how do you make it better? Well, the number doesn't matter. It sounds crazy to say, but in a setting like this, if you're not sitting with a lender, of course it's important when you're sitting with a lender applying for a score or applying for a loan, that score they get is going to be really important. But if you're trying to figure out what to do about it, what people don't know is that every time a credit score is calculated, a series of risk factors are generated. Those risk factors tell you exactly what from your credit report most affected that score. Those risk factors are very consistent from one scoring system to another. So the numbers can be very different. The risk factors will be very consistent. Address those risk factors, tie them back to your credit report, use them to address issues in your credit report. All of your credit scores will get better. That is the most important thing I can share with you today about credit scores is that you should focus less on the number and more on that credit risk factors that you receive. Take care of your credit report. All of your credit scores will take care of themselves. Um, poll number three, which is not a score factor. Well, I mentioned we don't have asset information. So the balance of your checking account isn't going to affect credit scores. Here's what goes into scores. It's This is from the Vantage Score 3.0. You'll see for, Vantage Score 4.0, FICO pie charts, very similar. Payment history is always the most important. Are you paying your bills on time or are they late? In this case, they're about 40% of the score. FICO, they're somewhere around 30, 35%. Utilization is your balance to limit ratio on your credit card. So if you have high balances as compared to your credit uh, limits, it's going to hurt your credit scores. Add them all up, add up all your limits, all of your balances. That's total utilization. In this case, that's about 20%. And then they look at individual balances. So utilization on individual cards, that's another 11%. That's about 31%. When you see a FICO pie chart, those are lumped together. And so they're somewhere, again, between 30 and 35%. So you're talking... 60 to 70% of a credit score is paying your bills on time and keeping your balances low on your credit cards. If you do those two things, you will have good credit scores because everything else builds on those. How long you use credit, your depth of credit, the kinds of credit you have take time to build. Recent credit, are you paying your bills on time or are you late? Have you applied for new credit? Have you not? Is another 5% and then available credit. Your kind of capacity measure is about 3%. So pay your bills on time. Keep your balances low. You're going to have good credit scores. Time is key. You can't fix the number. You have to change the information in your credit report. To do that, you need to address the risk factors and do that over time. Lenders love boring, dull people when it comes to credit. It means you're paying those bills on time. There's no surprises. They don't have to worry about that. Really important. 
with that, just a few resources. Uh, you can get a free credit report score at Experian.com through our monitoring service every 30 days. A FICO 8 score, you get monitoring. So if things change in your report, we monitor the dark web if there's your identity has been stolen. So lots of resources and tools as well can be a great tool. You can get a free credit report from each of the, cre the credit bureaus at annualcreditreport.com once a week. So not just once a year right now. I'm not sure that we'll go back to once a year. We may at the end of this year, but annualcreditreport.com is where you get the free report. You can also call or mail uh, to get that. Couple of resources with us. You can join me every Wednesday at this time, two o'clock central, three Eastern at ex.pn slash credit chat, our weekly credit chat on Twitter. We talk about all sorts of personal finance issues, including credit and credit scores and other things. And if you go to experience.com slash credit education, you'll find thousands of articles about personal credit, go to experience.com slash consumer education. You'll find a version of this presentation as well as other published materials and resources you can use to help inform and, and manage your credit better. And with that, I'll stop talking and Lena, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, sorry, we are a little bit over today. Uh, we do have a new question in the chat box. As an authorized user on any credit card, will it continuously affect my credit scores? Which credit bureau counts the most? Yeah. So as an authorized user, you are not responsible for the debt. So as long as that account is positive, meaning it's paid on time and not late, it will show in your report and it will show you as an authorized user. If that account becomes late or becomes negative in some way, Experian will take it off of your credit report. So it's very safe to be an authorized user because it's not going to negatively affect your credit history, uh, but it, it it could positively help it. Uh, so it, it will not affect scores if it becomes negative. But as long as it's reported as an authorized user, it's, it's going to be incorporated in score calculations and can help them. Uh, in terms of which matter the most, I would love to say Experian. The reality is it's it's we're all national. We all compete nationally. Lenders typically use all three. Uh, but the lender may choose which one is their primary provider. Uh, and we hope Experian is. Um, <laughs> I would not just kid, not kidding. I think that we have the most accurate, most complete, most current information. Uh, and we also do more to connect with people. We think about uh, driving financial inclusion and what we think of internally as being the Consumers Bureau, because we want to help people be more financially healthy and more successful because that's good for Provident and, and banks as well. We want to be the organization that connects people with lenders and other financial services and helps people be more financially healthy and, and drive financial inclusion. So um, I think Experian is, but <laughs> I'm slightly biased in that regard. Uh, and I see just in the chat, just having to look, do tax liens affect credit? Not anymore, not in a credit report. Uh, we've removed tax liens from credit reports, both paid and unpaid. Uh, that that said, there are other organizations who may collect them, uh, LexisNexis, for example. So they might still be considered, but they're not going to affect the credit score in the same way. Um, the numbers are different from Karma to Experian. Uh, yes, because they're at Credit Karma, they use a Vantage score. So that's kind of like saying, if you say Chevrolet and Ford, Vantage score Chevrolet, FICO's Ford. So they're two different scores. There's Their calculations differ. What you will find is that if you have a good score in one, you will have a good score in the other though. So instead of looking just at the number and trying to compare number to number, look at what those numbers mean in the report you get for them. So if you get a report from a, a monitoring service, look at does it say you have great credit you have good credit you have you know prime credit or near prime credit and then look at if you get a score from provident does it say you have great credit or near prime my guess is you they will both say you have great credit uh, uh, or good credit uh, but the numbers won't match they almost never do for uh, lots of different reasons so so that that's fine um 200 points depends on the score and the scale so it could well be the scale Okay, and we'll take one more question. What are the risk factors and how do they affect credit reports and scores? So there are as many as 300 different risk factors that a credit score might consider from a credit report. 
Uh, typically, the, you know, the top ones, when you get a score and they get the risk factors, you will typically get four. If you get five, the fifth one will say inquiries because we call it the fifth factor in the industry. Because if a, an inquiry affects a score by even a single point, the credit reporting companies, the scoring companies are required to list it as a, as a, uh, as a risk factor. That will always be the least important factor. If you have inquiries listed, there will always be things that are more important. Um, the key ones are always your payment history. So are you paying on time or are you late? If you have late payments, it's going to wreck your credit scores. Uh, utilization rate, your balances compared to your limits, your credit limits is too high. And there are different variations on that. So balances on a single card, balances in total and so on. Um, you know, those are the two by far most important uh, length of credit history. Um, things like that are all going to be part of, of those risk factors. So there are lots, depends on, this, on the scoring systems. Um, Rod, just one more. Are landlords required to report good report or do I have to ask for them to do it? Yeah, landlords do not report proactively for the most part. That's where Experian Boost comes in. If you go to Exp enroll in Experian Boost, we, we work with about 1,500 property management companies and several online uh, providers you may be able to have your rent payments reported and only positive in that case. Uh, so we would report the positive rent payments. So it, they don't report to us typically. And no, no, it doesn't cost anything to report for us. The, and for, for the landlord, it doesn't, we don't charge them to report to us either. Uh, but they, they may not, there are third party providers that sometimes charge a, a fee. So if you work in an online service, you can pay your rent through them in some cases, they will then pay the landlord and then report the information to the credit bureaus. Sometimes landlords will work with them and there can be a service fee for them, but not with Experian. If someone is a victim of identity theft, how do they remove unauthorized use on their credit report? Yeah, so we have a whole, President, we can spend another hour on identity theft, but the short answer is this. If you believe you're a victim of identity theft, go to experian.com slash fraud and add an initial security alert on your credit report that says, I believe I'm a victim of identity theft. Before granting credit my name, please verify my identity or call me. And you can provide a telephone number. We will send you a free copy of your credit report. If there's any information that is you, fraud that you believe is fraudulent, you can dispute that information as fraudulent. We typically, we'll connect you with a representative because it gets complicated with fraud. Um, you know, it's, it's a little different than you know, my payment wasn't late. So we'll connect you with a fraud, trained fraud representative and help you dispute that information as fraudulent. From there, uh, if you know your victim, file a police report with your local police agency or law enforcement agency. They'll know what to do. This has happened to me and I've actually gone through this process. Add an extended fraud victim statement. It says, I am a victim of identity theft before granting credit. My name, call me and you provide two telephone numbers. Lenders cannot ignore those. They are required to respond to those statements. We share the alerts with the other credit bureaus so they'll be on all three uh they're free uh the initial alert lasts for a year the extended alert lasts for seven years you are required to provide a police report or an identity theft report um in california the dmv has a fraud report that qualifies so different ways to get those but the police reports kind of the most common um and we'll add that alert and then you can dispute that information as fraudulent will help you do that Thank you, Ron. And one very last question. How long do they take for the landlord to report to reflect the credit report? Yeah. So with Experian Boost, it's instant because we're not going to the landlord. What happens with Experian Boost is you tell us, I pay rent this amount and I pay it from this account. So you give us permission to access that payment from your checking account or your savings account, your credit card account that you pay each month. And we add that as your rent payment account in your credit report. And each month we'll capture that payment and add it to your credit history. We'll capture up to two years. So in a matter of a few minutes, you could have two years of rent payment history added to your credit report and only positive information. Thank you, Rod. Well, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you all for attending and I hope this session was helpful to you. As a reminder, we will be sending you a follow-up email with today's presentation. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.